Oh man, we're already starting t- talking about the next cube gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have to give Chris and a check a hard time. Uh, <laughs> too, too soon, man. Too soon. <laughs> well, at least at least the CFP is open until sometime after the current cube con. Um, but yeah, I think we definitely want to get some talk proposals in um, there as well on an assignment from the broader community. <laughs> nice. Great. So um, if anyone is new, please um, hop onto the network service group meeting notes. Uh, there should be a link in the chat and add yourself to the uh, attendees list. So I think we should go ahead and uh, and get started. So I don't know how long today is going to be. Uh, it'll probably be a relatively short agenda compared to, to normal, considering we're in this uh, weird uh, time between KubeCon and, uh, and holiday breaks. Um, so I'd like to spend most of the time talking about uh, things uh, that happened within KubeCon and, uh, and then we'll uh, continue on with main agendas uh, on, so what's the one after the first? Uh, January, January 8th, so. Yeah, we, we, we have gone on record and we discussed I think this, I think last meeting, um, we are on record as January 8th being the first meeting after the holidays. So that we don't drag people here on the first. Okay, so let's go and get started. Uh, agenda bashing, is there anything anyone would like to discuss uh, that is not part of the meeting notes already? Um, yeah. You know. Um, is is there something that you want, or like a particular topic? Uh, no, I. I mean, I have this this topic that I I, I have put as an issue already about splitting, but I guess that this is too too deep dive, and you know, pre holiday probably is not. It's not well, the time I, now. We, we can we can do it whenever you feel comfortable doing it, absolutely. Um, and I think there are aspects of it that are sort of deep dive in terms of things like sort of circular dependencies between repos. But mm. it, it probably doesn't hurt to sort of submit the idea, um, you know, even though it may be a little premature to actually make a decision on it. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can get started on on that. Um, I, I agree with the, the sentiment that um, an, an, an actual decision will want to hold off until... Uh, yeah, until of course, probably. of course, of course, of course. So. I think it's important though. I mean, if you can't make a network service that's not part of the repository and until we split, we won't find out, then, you know, it's almost the whole point of the project. So we, we, we have to find out whether this works. To be fair, we all know, no matter how well intentioned you are, until you actually do go create a thing at another repo, you're never really sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, I actually tried doing this. That's why I started working on the SDK. Yeah, yeah, because I have my this my project with uh, uh, you know videos and things, and um, yeah, I tried to import it, and then it was almost impossible. So I I started working on this SDK with this exact idea, so that you can decouple the examples, and you should be able to do NSCs and NSCs. Uh, completely independent from from the repo. Yeah, yeah those are extra points. So let's add it. Let's add it to the agenda. We can talk about some of the initial uh, reasonings behind it. Okay, good. I think we're well into the uh, people generally agree it's a good idea. And now we're quibbling about what it takes to get for me to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so um, events. So does does someone have a readout from KubeCon? Um, I, I, I think a lot of us can sort of make comments. We were all there. Um, so we, we had, I think, something like 11 different things going on between various talks and, you know, demos and booths and whatnot. Um, from my perspective, it went super, super well. I think we had something like Two or three hundred people in the intro talk, and maybe about fifty less than that in the deep dive. Lots of good questions, and then we had 
both cases, like a mob of maybe 20 folks or so for some time afterwards in the hallway who were asking questions and wanting to talk about it. Um, yeah, so there, was, there was somebody in the audience vocally calling for documentation. <laughs> yeah, but we ignore that guy, so it's not a big deal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think he had a totally valid point, to be fair. Uh, yeah, but we just ignore him anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> I had noticed that, yes. Um, so among other things, um, we ended up doing that. So we ended up doing at the intro um, a demo that, that Frederick cobbled together where he live on stage in six minutes writes a working CNF and deploys it to network service mesh, which is, is kind of awesome. And we were also able to, I demoed quite a few times in many things, uh, Matthew and David uh, and all of the folks um, on the Skydive team for all your, your help on all of this. I ended up demoing quite a few times using the Skydive, um, you know, the Skydive integration, showing folks the, essentially the Sarah story where we can deploy the chain of your know, client to firewall to VPN gateway as the secure internet connectivity service. And that was also super well received. Great. Other folks want to share impressions? Um, I can say that this definitely made a lot of noise within VMware. So I had a lot of people contacting me and a lot of internal discussions going on. Also, the guy from Charter Communications, he also came to me talking about <clears throat> how, how NSM could eventually benefit his use case. So that would be, let's say, the, the most things that, that were for me. And of course, thank you all for, um, for you know, pr announcing this. This was really great, uh, completely un unexpected. So thank you for, for announcing my promotion to a committer. Yeah, this was something we, we kind of surprised Nikolai with at the intro talk. Um, at the end of the talk, we announced his promotion to NSM committer, which is further down here in the agenda. So congratulations again, Nikolai. And from what you said, it was well-timed in terms of who was in the audience and, and so forth. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I was, uh, I was quite happy with the, um, uh, with uh, having us make the announcement, so. Like you've done a fantastic job. So again, like thank, like personally, like thank you as well. So uh, like you've done some amazing work. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I've had a, I had a lot of people come up and ask me, and I had a bit of a weird experience as well because um, um, Heather gave her talk. Heather is the uh, person from. Uh, the Linux Foundation networking, and mm -hmm. she decided to open it, open it up, and allow people to basically ask questions. And apparently, several people in that uh, in that talk uh, were very telco oriented, and there were a lot of questions that were popping up about network service mesh and um, and potential integrate and so on. So uh, the fact that people were like actively asking about it uh, in these venues, I think, is, is incredibly promising. So, I, I think we've I think we've hit a really good uh, a really good spot. Yeah, one thing because you mentioned telco, and at least up till kind of before KubeCon, my impression was that the main use case for NSM would be telco, and apparently, I mean, a lot of people from the telco business are interested in it. But um, from some of the discussions there, it actually appeared that uh, a lot of the and enterprise workloads who could also benefit and yeah we had this conversation with the SIG networking guy that actually discussing you know running Kistio on top and different use cases there so I think that this is also at least for me some some key takeaway that actually we shouldn't focus only on telco and try to to gain some other interest from other people right yeah I completely yeah. completely agree so yeah, well, you, you have to bear in mind the demonstration played strongly towards non-telco use cases because yeah, yeah. that's not how a telco would put it to use. So I think we kind of open people's minds about how this might be more generally useful. Also, KubeCon's not so much a telco event like you might find at the OpenStack Summit. So um, the audience that we had was, might well have had a lot of telco people in, but it certainly wasn't uh, as exclusively telco as it might have been. 
Yeah, but I think one of the things we have to keep firmly in mind is we have really big markets both in enterprise and in service provider. And one of the things that I think is probably going to be one of the, the better services that we could do for the SP industry is to have a single solution that is popular both for enterprise and SP, because I think SP has historically been very, very hurt for the fact that you had a bifurcated stack. You had, this is the way you normally do networking and the way you do networking if you're trying to do an SP thing. And that's, I think, gone poorly. I mean, we do have some folks here from SPs who can comment and if you'd like to, but I think that's just traditionally gone poorly. And so I actually think it's crucial to get one good solution that meets both sets of needs. Yeah, and I, I also suspect that as uh, enterprise continues to mature, that many problems that you see in uh, traditional telco uh, or service providers, enterprises will start to hit as well. So even things like the VPN example with uh, uh, Sarah's story, I think is a really great example where when you start to, to deal with very large enterprises, uh, then things like how do you, not only how do you connect to, to Sarah's uh, system, but how do you even set up that VPN in the, in the first place and connect to that remote system and set up the underlay configuration and so on. Uh, these, are, these are all things that become important in the enterprise side when you've hit a certain, a certain scale. And so, so I think we have a unique opportunity to be a bridge uh, effectively or a unified solution that allows people to tr ultimately treat both of them the same. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's definitely part of the goal. Um, the other thing, comment I would make about the example with Sarah's story, um, the, the reason I typically lead with that example is because the, the networking people in the room immediately see the implications of it <laughs> and they'll project it to more complicated cases. Um, and, but, but that would not be true in the opposite direction. If I led with a more SP focused story, it yeah. would be run clear to the enterprise company why they cared. So we need an Envoy example? <laughs> oh yes, yes, I, I, I understand. <laughs> there, there, are, there are a lot of cool things that we, we, we want to say. Yeah. Um, and and, and I, I think we're gonna be in this interesting place of, um, you know, both maturing and expanding our capabilities at the same time. Yeah. Also, um, I came across a really, just for a next demo, I came across a really nifty uh, tool. So uh, are you from, I, I'm not sure if people are familiar with, uh, with Jupyter, but uh, effectively you can think of it like uh, people often use it with Python so that you can, basically type markdown and then intersperse it with, uh, with code and run the code is all part of a web document. Turns out there's a Golang version or Golang integration that, that someone has done. So one option is we could do a, a Jupyter uh, style document that describes what it is we're doing, run a snippet of code and effectively build up a, uh, a network service as and uh, and documenting it as as we go as to what's going on, so it makes it much more readable. And then you can then commit them to Git, and GitHub will render render the the final results properly as well. Awesome. So, right. so it might be a little interesting uh, thing that we can do to to help with uh, documentation and uh, and demos and give people a uh, scratch space where they can where they can experiment. So. Sounds awesome. Um, let's see, anything else from, from KubeCon as well? Um, did, anyone, did anyone else want to talk about? Yeah, anyone else who was there? I know we got several other people on the call who were there, so very curious of their perspectives. knowing what those things are so we can fix them next time. Okay, well, if anything comes up, definitely definitely bring it up. Um, okay, so. Sorry, Fred, I was, I was trying to find my mute button. 
I think one thing, <laughs> sure. one thing Ian and I chatted over um, a beer was and a napkin is how to make this work in public cloud. Mm. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are many uh, potentials of how to make this work in, in public cloud. Well, what exactly do you have in mind? Um, not quite sure. It's what, what we use the data path, I think, is, is the issue. And while it's tied, you know, you, you can use VPP. It gets really complex to try and deploy that into public cloud. Yeah. So it, 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 it may not be, you know, that easy, but I think looking at it, I don't know if Ian, if you kept that sketch. Um, I didn't keep the sketch, but because uh, it was in Heather's notebook, I think the one <laughs> sketch I drew. But um, so, so technically speaking, it's still around, but I would say uh, on a handful of things, firstly, I have with a certain degree of beating my head against a brick wall, run VPP in AWS and got it to, running it in AWS is easy. Running it and getting it to actually eat an interface is annoying. Um, and uh, running it at all certainly involves um, giving the VM some startup tweaks, but it can be done. Um, I think one of the things here, I was looking at the code, code the other day, I have no time to code, but uh, I was looking at the code the other day um, and weeping over Frank's use of, um, Frederick's use of, um, uh, of make files to write scripts. But, you know, that aside, um, if you look at what he's done with Terraform, uh, then he's written some Terraform for one backend provider. Um, but potentially we could use that Terraform to work against other backend providers. Um, and if we basically ported it to uh, AWS, that might be a potential way of making sure that if people want to use it for AWS rather than anything else, we could, um, we could make that a development environment, uh, which might be um, a little easier for people to consume than pack it and certainly a bit faster than pack it. Um, and then we're building the idea that it works in AWS from the start rather than it being an afterthought. Um, but uh, in, in terms of how you would deploy it, then um, if we wanted to use, and you've heard my comment, well, Ed's heard my comments, other people have heard my comments about how data planes should probably be normal network services at some point. But if you wanted to use an interface type that was basically a tap interface to a bridge, um, then uh, to, to kind of connect um, data planes and whatever to the outside world, we could probably come up with a deployment model for that so that we've got, you know, some external connectivity from the VM to the outside world that we could actually build on. Uh, and again, Terraform could probably help us along with that because you can assign multiple IP addresses to, um, uh, to um, uh, AWS machines and theoretically, uh, much of a theory at this point, that means you can run VPP without letting it grab an interface at all, um, which means we could have a data plane running. Yeah, one of the things it's not I, how you'd run it in production, but it's how you can test it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we do actually have issues, and I would love to see people work on getting this work in public cloud environments. Um, you know, I, 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 and so we can, we can definitely, you know, if there are people interested in doing that, um, we would love to see the expansion in that direction. I know the machinery was intentionally written with the flexibility to let people pick um, other kinds of environments that they, they drop things into. We default to Vagrant, but it, it supports other options and it's easy to add other options for the most part. Yeah, uh, v Vagrant, uh, the reason I was hacking on this is Vagrant's a pain in the ass for me because Vagrant likes virtual box and doesn't like a lot of other things and I don't run virtual box. So I was sitting there uh, beating on it to try and get it to run against libvirt and then it was like, yeah, can't do that with Vagrant and so on and so forth. But, but um, uh, yeah, again, the, the Terraform framework is closer to the mark for that. Um, Terraform has a bunch of backend providers and AWS is certainly one of them. So uh, that would be a nice option to, uh, and maybe not a particularly difficult option to work with. So one thing I do want to point out is that the um, that I do know it works for VMware because I use that all the time. And then we have a patch out that uh, that Matthew pushed for getting it to work with Libver. And I think we're literally just kibitzing back and forth about whether or not to lock into SSHFS. So you know, we have people who have done that work on the Vagrant stuff, but I'm I'm well familiar with your frustrations. And Vagrant. Is mm, yeah, I, and well, my point is that Vagrant's a nice development tool, but it's only ever a development tool, whereas Terraform's a production tool. Um, so. 
Um, I, I'm not saying necessarily we go one way or the other, but I am saying that if we can find a way to make the Terraform code a little bit more general purpose, um, and it's built very close to the mark already, then um, we should be able to make Terraform run against a bunch of back-end providers. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine with that. Although, quite frankly, I'd also love to explore simply running against the Kubernetes provided in many of these public clouds, not necessarily even Terraforming VMs, although that's certainly also an option. Yeah, but yeah, we, so we can try both of these things. I mean, people run both ways in production, so it's not like... Um, uh, it's not so much we have to choose one way, it's that uh, we can experiment a little bit and see what works for us. I, I don't know quite how EKS uh, and friends work against um, work in terms of giving privilege away. Um, and of course, they'll have very opinionated virtual machines with no huge pages, so um, there's a limit to how, how useful that might be. Yeah, as long as we're not grabbing physical interfaces um, from the can I show it working at all, huge pages is not required. A huge page is actually kind of a pain in the ass, um, particularly if you're trying to use it with a DPDK interface. Um, yeah, uh, and again, it, so my expectation here, and, and I tried this once a while back and didn't have a great deal of joy, so I'd have to go and revisit it, but you can use a TunTap interface as your DPDK interface, and that's probably the easiest way we could actually get this even loosely working within AWS. Otherwise, you end up using some very expensive virtual machine types. Um, in order to get VPP to run. So um, it, it's on my job list for other reasons anyway. This is actually what we do now. The thing we do now, um, which is great from a make sure it works all the time, although not great from a make sure it performs optimally all the time, is the, the data plane literally is just running VXLAN against its pod interface with AF packet. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and again, that works. There, there are reasons why I never got that to work in Amazon, because um, if you're using Amazon standard interface, then even putting it in a bridge domain tends to get the virtual machine upset. Um, so we'd have to experiment a little bit. Cool. Anyway, uh, let's see. I think we were also, we were in the middle of events. Yeah. So, so events-wise, uh, we have a lot to talk on, the, on these provisioning stuff, so we'll come back to that later on. Uh, so, FOS, so we have FOSDEM Brussels coming up, and that is in February 2 through 3, and Nikolai has added a similar talk already. Uh, Nikolai, do you, have you received the uh, I, uh, decision on whether it was accepted or not? No, not yet. I guess that probably not. I mean, if if it's not accepted by that time, I don't know if when was the, the deadline, but hmm. yeah, I think that we can scratch that safely. Cool. So we'll go ahead and leave this uh, this up for for the moment. Okay. We we also have a call for papers for KubeCon EU. So. Please um, think about what type of things you would like to talk about. Uh, and they don't need to be uh, network service mesh oriented. If you have a problem you're solving where network service mesh can help, uh, those, are, those are super useful because uh, effectively getting, um, sh showing where people are, are doing something interesting with it, with it interspersed uh, is a powerful way to show that it's gaining traction. Uh, we also have Mobile World Congress coming up. And so uh, if you have avenues to show off any demos or anything similar to that, uh, definitely get in touch of, with, uh, with me and Ed. And uh, we'll, we'll work to, to make sure that you can put something compelling on. Um, are there any other events that anyone can think of that we should add to the agenda that we should pay attention to? Um, there's got to be an ONS at some point, but I think it's April, um, but it's probably the next thing out beyond what you've already got. Yeah, ONS in, uh, is going to be in San Jose, California. That's very convenient. <laughs> yeah. I always look for all these exciting places to go, and they announce San Jose, and it's like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> well, it means you can, get, you can get, go out drinking and get an Uber home, so there's always that. 
<laughs> it's, it's actually easier if I'm in the hotel because I could just go up the hotel room. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I just wanted to ask about the KubeCon EU. Um, do you think that we should try to create some kind of um, overview um, talk? Like by May, we should have something like. I don't know what's the status of the project, where we are. I mean, we should have some something. Yeah, I, I, I think probably we should get some talks like that in. It would also be good to get talks in from folks who are looking to use network service mesh. Um, you know, in, in sort of you know for for productionist sorts of use. I know mm -hmm. we have on the call who are like that now. Um, I think that would also be interesting. You know, it would be good to get a breadth of proposals in from folks. I, you know, as much fun as Frederick and I have doing our song and dance, and we will probably do it again in Cube Kani U, um, it would be good to get a broader set of folks talking about it as well. I, we, we also need to bring it down to the concrete. If we can get things working in May that are um, less, you, you know, hypothetical and more uh, useful, then that obviously is a big step in the right direction. Yeah, I, I will argue my six minute CNF is useful. <laughs> and impressive. Uh, I, I will argue your, <laughs> it will be useful when you document it. <laughs> Thanks, Fair okay. enough. Audience. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, well, I think that uh, you, you are correct with it as well. Like having something that is more concrete that we can, that we can show off, like we can still, maybe, maybe part of it as well as we can show off the six minute CNF, but using the, uh, using the SDK and show off that we now have an SDK that people can, can use and that it's easy to import and just get a CNF running. And I think that that'd yeah, be incredibly yeah. powerful. The other one, I think yeah, well, one of the things, in fact, that your demo shows is that, uh, but, but doesn't ever actually mention in very, very many words, is you're taking a piece of code and modifying it to be a different piece of code. So you're, you, in some senses, not writing it from scratch, but, um, but basically taking something that already exists and repurposing it. Now, you're not going to write something from scratch with even the most elegant SDK in six minutes, but on the other hand, um, that would be one thing. It's, you know, to, to give someone a feel that, that if they basically started a new repository and wanted to write themselves a network service, then they could do in fairly short order. Um, but more useful, I think, because you have to remember the audiences we appeal to are not all the same, is it's well and good to appeal to programmers and say, look, I can do this so incredibly quickly. And that's got uses for their managers as well. But what's most useful for, for the people with um, checkbooks is... Um, not watching it being written, but seeing somebody spin something up and do something useful again. So the use case is more important than the um, than the coding side of things, um, because yeah, then people get paid to work on this. Which, you know, otherwise they just want to work on this, and nobody will give them the time. One thing I do want to point out, I think that would also be a big wow factor at KubeCon EU, would be showing this deployed across multiple public cloud providers um, and working, um, because I think that really makes it super super real. And in fact, what we may want to do is actually tell a little bit of our ENSM story. If we could do a demo where we deployed network service mesh to the various public cloud providers, Kubernetes, and then we showed the multi-cloud story of being able to use ENSMs to consume a network service from one in another, I think that ends up being kind of super compelling. Even if we can't use the uh, ENSM element of things, even if we could at least deal with um, you know, uh, individually created GRE tunnels with a GRE service of some variety, it would be better than nothing. But the point is you're demonstrating something concrete, which we can't do today, which is um, low level networking out of a Kubernetes cluster, which has never been a possibility. Yeah, agreed. So lots of good ideas there, it sounds like. Um, and so it's probably easy to get that pulled together and, and chart it out. Yeah. But you know, it's one of those things, January 18th feels far out right now because it's a month. Back on January, it will be right here in our face. So. Uh, it feels too close to me. <laughs> yeah. so, so folks should think about what they want to do, and, and let's let's try and get a broad array of talk proposals in. I think it would be good. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat my previous sentence uh, too soon. <laughs> so we also have, OK, so we have uh, moving on to the main agenda. So uh, we've already 
announced Nikolai in case you missed it. Nikolai is uh, a is now a, a committer on uh, network service mesh. So he now has the uh, if we we'll have to make sure that you that you have access to everything that that that, that entitles. So if you're missing anything, uh, uh, let me know, and I'll do my best to you to get you whatever you need. It works from what I can tell. I tried both repos, so. And do you have a uh, do you have a packet account that as well? Have we set you up with that? Um, no. Okay, I'll make sure you get added to that. Okay. Um, let's see. Just, excuse me. Just wanted to to discuss a little bit about uh, KubeCon, and uh, I wanted to know if there was some uh, some talk about uh, moving from VNF to CNF. Because this is an important part for the telco, telco, telco environment. Ah, there, there was a talk that was given by, by Dan Cohn, who spoke about VNF to CNF, yeah. uh, which reminds me, I need to have a conversation with him because he posted uh, uh, effectively. He posted Multis versus Network Service Mesh, and uh, I need to, I need to have a conversation with him on that. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, some general uh, discussion about it, but is there any something, anything concrete about uh, moving uh, from uh, legacy well, VNF to, to CNF? Uh, no, nothing concrete yet. Well, there, there's a little bit what would you want to see? Legacy fire firewalling, for instance. Uh, I know that we have some vendors who are thinking about moving to the, to the CNF world, uh, but uh, they are saying that uh, uh, their, um, their VNF is small enough to run uh, not to be uh, uh, to be uh, to be moved to the to the container world, things like this. But I don't know if there are some concrete workloads that we can use to demonstrate uh, the the move yeah, to so the CNS world. We actually did that for this is something that, that Dan talked about, and, and also some of the folks from the the Volt team who are often participants here. They actually did that work and did that demonstration and did performance measurements. Um, and and so. They show that can be done. Generally speaking, when you look at moving a VNF to a CNF, there, there are sort of two big impediments that you run into, uh, generally speaking. The first one is um, VNF's data plane has to be a pure user space data plane. And most people who've written VNFs have hacked the ever loving hell out of the kernel. Um, and so that's the first impediment. And the, the way the, the Volk guys got around this was they used the VPP data plane both for the VNFs and the CNFs, which made the lift and shift basically trivial. Um, and then the second thing that you have to solve is what I sometimes call the uh, the wiring problem, which is how do you chain together and compose together CNFs and Kubernetes? Because Kubernetes networking gives you all, exactly one interface typically. And that's the, the major problem that Network Service Mesh is currently trying to solve here. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, there, there was definitely stuff that was done there. I think there's also going to be a splash at Mobile World Congress on VNF CNF migration. But the, the, the net net is, I expect the number one problem most vendors are going to have is if they have built a data plane by hacking up a kernel, they're going to have to go and take something like VPP off the shelf and, or, or build something like VPP as a pure user space data plane um, in order to make the leap. I, I think you're, um, well, there's two things to that. One is that there aren't very many VNFs out there with a hacked up data plane at this point. Um, they're, they're nearly all running DPK of one variety or another because you simply, you wouldn't be able to sell something that runs at the level of performance that kernel allows you to run for, for the VNF use cases that exist. But um, uh, you say those are the major problems, but I think you're, um, you're, you're focusing right at the bottom of the stack. There's another major problem that nobody's explained, which is Etsy doesn't apply to Kubernetes at all. Um, so there's no, no one knows how orchestration is going to work. No, that, that's also, it's also a problem. But the, the other problem that I think you run into with DPDK is DPDK tends to make a bunch of presumptions about the new mm -hmm. infrastructure that is super, super hard to actually get to work properly um, in a cloud native environment. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, uh, but no, yeah, I agree. And well, we had this conversation yesterday between ourselves, but um, one, that's the thing we, we can fix a part of the problem, but it doesn't solve the problem with, with NSM. We've, we've got to work out what we have to do to tools that people actually use, and that means DPDK, practically speaking, so that if I wrote something with DPDK, I don't have to give the container running it the, the keys to the kingdom, because if you're trying to run 
multiple VNS, and that's the plan here, otherwise you wouldn't be doing this, uh, within a single host, and um, you're running DPDK, and every single one of them needs a fully privileged container, uh, or even a partially privileged container, then this isn't gonna fly in production. You wouldn't trust anything, and your vendors wouldn't support it. So that, that's another element of this. We need to accept that um, we have to get the DPDK people, or we have to help the DPDK people change the way they think. So yeah, I what I got from Marian is that MIF uh, PMD is going to be opening soon in DPDK. I mean, we should be able to run just by setting it up. Uh, so that, that, if that were the only thing, that would be super wonderful. But if there, there's a longer list of things where DPDK makes presumptions about the perfection of the world or your complete ownership or mutability of the, the environment that tend to be false and unachievable in Kubernetes. Um, that's a lot more forgiving about many of these things. You run it without DPDK, although if you use the DPDK plugin to access a physical NIC, you're stuck with all those presumptions. There's active conversations going on in the DPDK community about how to sort some of these things out. Um, but I guess the, 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 the fundamental thing, and this always gets super tricky, is um, when your underlying presumption for a long time has been that the infrastructure can be molded to your will, and you get deployed to cloud native where the presumption is that the infrastructure is more or less immutable um, or at the very best, a small number of knobs you can turn, um, then it's going to be a culture shock. So but how about if we, uh, if we put together, we don't need to run Kubernetes to give them the working environment that would give them some idea of the problems. So if we basically give them clues enough to run a Docker container with the kind of interfaces we're looking for um, and no privilege whatsoever, yeah then they can go and test this without our assistance. Now, that's actually false, Ian. And I can tell you that from the experience from the Volt guys in this VNFCNF, because they went through and did that exercise in Docker. And when they went to Kubernetes, they discovered there were still a shit ton of presumptions that were made that you could make effectively in a Docker environment that they had been making that you could not make in a Kubernetes environment about the mutability of the infrastructure. And so they ran into Yeah, but that's my point about Docker environments is not what Docker does by default, but that with the right options, it's basically run a container the way Kubernetes would run a container. Because, and we know this to be true because Kubernetes runs on Docker. So it's not a question that this is not how Docker works by default. Absolutely, it isn't how Docker works by default. That's totally fine. It's a question of understanding, and we're in a better place to do that, I think, how to make a simulated environment that's roughly how DPDK will see the world from, from an NSM perspective. Can I interject a minute? Is the easiest way to actually get that right is to do it in Kubernetes. That is a hundred percent. Yes, it is, but that will take longer. So, yeah. no, actually, it won't. It won't, and here's why: because I guarantee it will take longer to tweak out and stay tweaked out with a Docker environment that has the particular set of constraints on it that Kubernetes imposes, and to keep up with those constraints is much more work and will take much more time than just. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a question of keeping up with this. It's a question of what could we do in the second week of January versus how long it will take us to have that working in real life. And again, I can tell you with the voice of experience, having worked closely with the Vault guys, dude, the, you, you've got the, the amount of work and the amount of time it's precisely flipped. Could I ask a question? Sure. Has anyone looked at AFXDP? As yes, I'm super for DVD? excited about AFXDP. Because, I mean, I've seen some Intel papers where they're getting almost the same performance as DPDK without any of the um, baggage. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited about AFXDP because it does look like it would, has the potential to crisply solve this problem. Um, and, and so the, 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 the two steps there, and I'm actually talking to people about this, would be how are we doing with this landing kernels and production systems? And right yeah. now, as I understand it, it's an alpha on core OS. Um, I don't know what the story is with Ubuntu, and I don't know what I'm allowed to say about the story with, with Red Hat. Um, and then the other thing is getting VPP support for AFXDP, and I'm, I'm talking to the FIDO community about that as well, because that would super simplify a ton of stuff if we could yeah. use AFXDP. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we might raise the same question of privilege again, because you presumably need some power to actually go sort of using those interfaces in that way. Yes, you do. Yeah, it, it's, it's the but, same. But as, we don't need, we, we, we don't need, sorry, uh, I was just going to say we don't need, um, we don't need VPP to be running here. We just need PMD to be running here. That we, uh, the, whatever the L2 PMD test is in DPDK is enough to prove this is going to fly. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure by the way, that um, we can centralize privilege in this regard. 
because what AFXTT really is doing for us is it is mapping it is mapping some set of packets from a physical interface into user space. And so I suspect we could pull a similar file descriptor passing game to what we do with MemIF um, and simply have an unprivileged thing say, here's my chunk of memory and have a, pri a single privileged thing on the system say, great, I'm gonna ask for this set of stuff to be mapped into your, to and from your memory. I suspect we could do something like that. And that would, I think, solve yeah. your privilege in the end. That, that may well be true, um, uh, but we don't know we can do it until we've seen it working. Test no, I, count. I agree. Cool. All right. So let's see. It's back onto the uh, main agenda. So we have um, we have an issue on managing issues in PRs. So um, this is definitely. So, so uh, Nikolai, I'll, I'll let you state the uh, the problem that, that you're thinking of. Yeah, so um, I definitely believe that uh, it would be great if we can have some dedicated call where we can just go up on the issue list and probably some pending long-standing PRs if such exist, but most importantly for issues and try to figure out where we want to, to move them, maybe schedule some resources or decide if this is more important than the other and point people to, 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 to that and along those lines. So um, I think that currently it's a bit of a randomish, if I may use that word. Um, it's an interesting idea. And my only, my only constraint would be we want to make sure we do this as a public call. Um, of, course, of course, of course. We remain open. Um, but it's an interesting notion. I guess the other question would be, is there a reason that we can't do that in this meeting? Um, because I, I, I'm absolutely in favor of getting this done and it's possible we need a, new, a different meeting for it. But, but I'm also, um, generally speaking, try and keep the shell of meetings smaller. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and if we need a second call, we need a second call. That, that, that may be true, but I, I'd rather, I think, try and do that here. Um, first, and then if it works here, that's great. And if it doesn't work here, then then we can look at a second call. If that makes sense to folks. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, to me, it sounds like this call is already overloaded. You you see what kind of discussion we just had, right? I mean, a lot of kind of very different things. Mm. Yeah, that may be true. That may be true. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm open to the possibility. Um, so I, I, I guess take my position as being generally supportive of doing uh, bug scrubs and then we can work out what the best mechanism is and, and go from there. Yeah. The, yeah um, the, the, the... Sorry, go on. Go on uh, well, I was just going to say that the main thing that we're going to want to do there is w w nobody will be able to find the woods for the trees if we don't do something about highlighting the, the top 10 issues or something like that in there. Um, because, you know, the number of issues will increase and increase. I guarantee for the time being, we'll be creating more than we get rid of. So um, the trick is going to be saying, this is the top of the pile. The rest of them we'll pretend not to notice for the time being. And, and that sounds like a committer responsibility to me. Yeah, there's, uh, there's another part to that as well, which is uh, trying to onboard newcomers. So I'll give you an example back from my early time over at uh, the Docker project. The, we would get new people in and they would look at something and it would look like it was trivial to do, but it, there might be mitigating factors that make it very difficult or vice versa. There might be something that looks very difficult to do and having someone or a group of people who can help groom these type of bugs and get them to a point where they don't necessarily go off and implement them, but they've done 70 or 80% of the design work on, on how to get there allows people to just pick it up and run with it. And then they need less handholding over the long term uh, and become much more effective committers. So for me, this is uh, not just about trying to prioritize which ones, but also making it easy to onboard people who want to actually contribute to, to, the, to the code base. Agree. Um, yeah, so, So let's let's go ahead and bring this up again on the on the next uh, on the next week, and we can try doing a, a bug scrub 
or rather let's we can try doing some grooming before beforehand and then bring it up into the into the main call so i think i think that there's some work that we have to do before we actually land into the uh, landed directly into the call so do you want to work with me on that so we can work out uh, what uh, uh, what type of things we want to to talk about um is it me yeah I mean, uh, yes yeah yes Fred. yes cool well anyone who's on here could to basically find their three favorite issues be them either important or low-hanging fruit and, and improve the quality of them. And then next call will be easier because there'll be some information to work from. Otherwise, we're basically, you know, the thing I've seen elsewhere is uh, people are reading the bug list, the issues list for the first time in the call, which uh, involves a lot of pausing and thinking and not a lot of time getting things done. Okay. Yeah, that's a good idea as well. Um... Yeah, I mean, also, like, uh, oh, feedback is always welcome on how to write better issues. I, I, I tend to put a fair bit of effort into writing issues, and I think sometimes it's helpful and sometimes it's not. Yeah, I think a large part of it is just going to, at this point, is going to be taking some of the uh, some of the issues as well. Like, I, I, you've, you've done a fantastic, you seriously upped your game on, on writing issues, so uh, <laughs> which I think it's, it's helped. Uh, we, we need to do the same on our side as well. Um, let's see. The next topic is going to be KubeCon CNF comparison, but I don't think we have either uh, Michael or Watson on the call, or, or do we? Okay, I'm guessing that we don't. I, um, I don't see them here now, and we don't think we have Taylor either. So. Yeah, so they have um, they have a CNCF comparison that's going to be done for KubeCon at EU, is, is my understanding. So we need to make sure that we jump straight back into that and help them with the next stage of their uh, of their comparisons. So, so that we get good numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and so splitting the examples from the main repo. Uh, I think we had some discussion on that earlier. Do we want to to talk a little bit more about this, or uh, had, do you think we've spoken enough on this, Nikolai? Uh, let me just try to 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 spend some sentence on, on it and try to explain my idea. So um, I have tried to written this uh, to to write this in the in the issue, but probably was not 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 really clear. So the the my idea is that. Um, I would prefer to see NSM core being the NSMD, everything from the control plane, maybe the data, oh, okay, the data plane also, being a separate repo where you, that you can develop and test without depending on examples or uh, Vagrant or Terraform or whatever is needed there, if you see what I mean. This, of course, presumes that we have a good testing like uh, unit testing infrastructure, um, which is not in place today, I understand, but maybe if we outline the problem, we can start working on it. Um, and uh, the idea is that um, I think that this should be just the source of producing the Docker files and nothing more than that. So if you want to, to implement an NSC, you just, um, in your environment, you just, um, just uh, say that that this, these are the network service images that you want with this and that version or the latest one. Then you import the package from the repo if that's needed for the SDK, for example, and you start developing without having to build your NSMD locally, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Of course, this, this will be far future. I'm not saying that this is something that we can do today or in in, in, in a month, but maybe if we set this as a kind of a common understanding and a target and start working towards it, maybe we can end up there eventually by, I don't know, KubeCon. <laughs> Does this make sense? Or still a little bit fuzzy? Yeah, the, the, idea, the idea makes sense. Uh, my, I think we have to think through, uh, th there are some, some significant benefits. Uh, we also have to, uh, work out what the uh, cost is going to be as well. Because once we split it up into multiple repos, then 
it's going to like how do we integrate that all the repos in uh, uh, CI for an example? Uh, so we have to make sure that we can trigger or build in all downstream projects simultaneously whenever whenever we have a, a build occur. So uh, we'll have to work out some of the um, some of the, we'll have to work out some of the paths along along that as well. Um, and I, I do think that um, we we're going to have to eventually split off some of the stuff around uh, uh, like perhaps the data plane should uh, should eventually live in its own in in its own repo with uh, with BPP mm -hmm. as an example or perhaps the uh, the SDK should be a, a standalone project and so I think we have some things to think about in 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 that side that would be easier to to start with and we can work out what the implications are from the CI over over time as we go so for for me that the biggest thing is going to be is going to be the CI and and test and the amount of uh, okay. of cognitive load on the developers so if we can find a way to constrain those then I think we can uh, we, we can get a lot of benefit out of it Cool. Well, yeah, that's, um, let's go ahead and explore that a little bit. And our next meeting is on the, on the 8th. Okay. So let's, let's bring it up to the, to the main group on, in, in that time as a, as a main topic. Okay. We'll do. Okay. And then, uh, we'll just skip the next one. Ah, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> <Screw you. laughs> nah, uh, design docs and how to program, uh, and how to program the docs and code comments. And so, yeah. Right. Let, let's just start, just start from the beginning. Um, much as Ed would like to tell you different because he loves writing slides, a document here is a document when it's committed because then if the document differs from the code, we have a bug and we can file a bug and we can fix a bug. So that's what I'm talking about there. Um, specifically things that are in the repository that tell us how to, how to do things that, that ultimately we can, you know, newcomers will prove out for us that, that they indeed are true. Um, uh, and I'm saying, speaking as someone again who was trying to use the vagrant stuff, it was I, I filed a bug on that the other day, so so it does actually work in practice. Um, the uh, the other thing here is this doesn't have to be a um, let's down tools and write, or you know, it's not going to be a let's down tools and write write all the documents before we move on. Um, it's more a question of. Um, for the time being, anyone who's doing a pull request needs to look at the code and say, does this code explain itself? Will it make sense to a newcomer? Will it make sense to me in three months? Um, is it current with the documentation or does the documentation need to change accordingly? So for the time being, um, the responsibility is don't accept code even from, from Ed. Um, if you uh, find that you can't make sense of it or that it's not actually documented somewhere. Uh, if you do that, then the documentation won't necessarily appear overnight, but it will continually get better the same way as the code does. So um, those are really the requests for the time being. Um, the other conversation I was having with uh, Frederick is, uh, at the at KubeCon is, is a slightly more abstract one, which is um, if we are if we have grand schemes in mind of how the world will work and doesn't work today, um, and that's what we're aiming for. Then again, writing documentation that explains that, um, and then putting it in the repository, even if it's not true, even if it's just the way you want the world to be. Um, if it goes in the repository and it's committed, then we can at least say this is what we all accept to be the truth. This is how we're all working, the aim we're all working for. So those are the three things I would suggest. If I may add, um, I would, because, okay, I have the rights now to approve uh, commits. Uh, I, would, I would like to see that we all start having a more, let's say, distinguished merge requests because today, it's a little bit like I find this bug, so I put it in my PR. No, no matter that it doesn't really, um, it's not really yeah. related. So my kind of like have a more structured pull request, which are focusing on a single thing, which have some decent explanation about what it really is about. So, yeah. Well, yeah. So, um, and here speaking from from a previous job, which involved generally speaking, not killing people. 
um, which mostly I succeeded at, so there's that, then um, it's, um, you have to remember when you're reviewing code that there are reasons why you would accept it and reasons why you would not. Um, and, and to be fair, it's a learning experience here on reviewing um, what, what's acceptable and what isn't. But um, you might want to think from that regard, what's good practice? What, what would be an absolute requirement or you won't take the code on? Um, because otherwise you just, you know, there's no threshold here. People just accept code because someone worked really hard to do it, regardless yeah. of the fact that it makes everybody else's life harder in the future. Mm -hmm. Documentation is one thing. It's not the only thing, but it, it's one thing you should be thinking about. And as you say, separating, separating things out so that everybody can see that one change does one thing and it's obviously doing the right thing. Otherwise, two changes, you mix them up and you, one of them gets lost in the other. You don't know whether it's complete and you can't really make it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think we'll find a good balance though because it's, um, it's a balance between how much red tape do we want to put on and at the, yeah. but at the same time making sure that we can, that we keep these complexity under under control as well. So I think uh, I, I, I think that you're we're thinking of this in the right direction. And I think part of it as well is uh, we have to, this gets down to uh, another core thing that we have to focus on, which is we've done a lot of work to get the demos up and up and running and to show and to show off the ideas. So think of it like proof of concept, like we've proved Mm -hmm. that we are able to take us in this direction. Uh, we have to start focusing on the quality side of it and start working out uh, bugs, documentation, design issues, and so on, and to start Lists. really solidifying it. Because uh, people, people will, it will excite people with what we've shown, but the, the only way we're gonna get into production is that it's a high quality project that solves a that solves a real need and an emphasis on the high quality because they'll people will wait for something else to come along to solve the problem if we're not uh, if we're not up to that uh, quality bar that we need to be yeah I, I would also focus on you know the fact that the more people join in the faster this will get done which means that if we make it hard for people to join in we lose that benefit but uh, uh, I, I would look at this yeah. the same way as if you if you put you know like linting or code checks in any new open source project people curse it for weeks and weeks and weeks and then magically it basically becomes second nature and they just don't write code that fails linting checks so um the same thing goes here they will curse you for weeks because you're insisting that you document things properly and then they will just do it automatically if you don't sort of start down the path of of setting that as a standard then then it will never be a standard cool well with that we're already a couple minutes over so i'm going to have to I'm gonna to have to cut the conversation short, and uh, yeah, let's let's make sure this ends up on the agenda on the eighth, so that we can talk about it in more in more detail, and let's work out exactly what type of uh, what type of bars we want to set and and the overall the overall direction. So, with that, uh, are there any last minute things or announcements that anyone has, or are we good to go? No. Nope. All right. Well, we will see you on January 8th, the same time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining in and see you then. Happy holidays, all. Happy holidays. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.